Well, if you have your Bibles, you're there in Genesis 47. Would you look in verse number 13, where the Bible says, And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us in our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their lands. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day in your land for Pharaoh. Lo, he recede for you, and ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four part shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. I want to preach to you a message this morning that I've entitled, How It Should Be. How It Should Be. I, 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 I must begin this message with some bad news, and I, I hate to do that to you. You've come to church today probably to be encouraged and not to be discouraged, but we do need to begin here. I know we're all excited about the beginning of a, of a new year. We're just two weeks in, essentially, but I'm going to rain on your parade for just a moment, if that's okay. See, 2024 is an election year. It's bad news, isn't it? <laughs> we, we understand what election years have come to mean in recent days. I, I hear the groans and, and the sighs as we make that announcement because we all know how weary some election years can be. Over the next several months, you are going to be exposed to countless ads, debates, campaign literature in your mailbox, and emails in your inbox over who to vote for. Each candidate is going to swear that he or she is the only one looking out for you and your interests, and at the same time, they're going to, they're going to, uh, they're going to claim that their opponent is the son of the devil himself. You know this to be true. <laughs> I may, be, I may be just a little overdramatic when I say these things, but not by much. Sadly, the American political system has jaded most of us throughout our lives, but especially it seems like in the last eight to ten years, things have become so much more hostile in the way that we communicate with one another and the way that we attack the other side of the political aisle. The things have gotten progressively more hostile and conspiracy abounds about stolen elections and shady politicians and the death of democracy. But as a preacher of God's word, I must tell you that despite our frustrations and our weariness with government, uh, doesn't change the fact that God has ordained it and given it power here on this earth. According to Scripture, government exists to punish evildoers and to bless those 
who live lawfully. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid." For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. You know, from a very young age, you can tell in a school environment who the, who the kids are that are doing the bad things. You can tell that by the way they act when the principal comes around. Right? I mean, immediately they, they get a little nervous. They get a little shifty in the way that they conduct themselves. Those that are doing the right thing, they don't have to live that way. If they're doing the right thing, it's when the authority comes around that they have problems. That's essentially what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, if you're doing the right thing, you shouldn't fear them. You should, uh, you should uh, come under them and you should respect them and be thankful for them. Uh, God's expectation is that his people be subject to government and that we, that we pay our taxes. In, in chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So it's very clear that in Romans chapter 13 that we are to submit ourselves to, to government authority. In that same passage, verse six, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. You know, I believe we should not only be subject to our government, and pay our taxes, but I also believe we should be involved in our government. In other words, I, I believe that as Christians we ought to vote. I believe we ought to go to special meetings. We ought to make phone calls. We ought to get to know our leaders. Some might, might in here might even need to run for political office. Those who do not vote and those who do not participate really have little to complain about. Now many have visions, hopes, and dreams for what their government can and, or should be. There are some in our society and culture who wish for what is known as maybe big government. This kind of government intervenes and intrudes into all areas of life. We, we might compare it to socialism or communism. There are people who want government to take care of their every little need and to be there to secure for them a favorable outcome in every situation. There are others who stand for what is known as limited government. This kind of government is limited to only those powers that are delegated to it by the laws that are written. This government is seen as a protection of individual rights and freedom uh, against government intrusion. The overwhelming reality as we observe our world today is that government is innately flawed because it is run by people. There is no savior in government. There is no savior in electing a certain leader. However, the Bible does talk about the benefit that comes in a society when there is a righteous man who is sitting in a position of authority. The Bible says in Proverbs 29 and verse number two, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourned. Now, to know what kind of government leaders you have, you have to ask yourself this question. Am I rejoicing today or am I mourning today? Now, this, doesn't, this isn't a Republican-Democrat issue. This is, this is a godly, ungodly issue. And if we look at our political system and we look at our leaders and we're overwhelmed with a sense of mourning and sorrow, then we've got a pretty good idea and we've got wicked men and wicked women sitting in high positions of authority. By the same token, if we look at our political leaders and our system and the way things are, and, and we rejoice and we're grateful for what we have and for who's ruling us, well, then we have a pretty good idea that there are some righteous people sitting in positions of power and positions of authority. We have a powerful example here in the 47th chapter of Genesis concerning what happens when a righteous man sits in a position of leadership or authority in a kingdom or a government. Joseph was elevated to this position back in Genesis chapter number 41, and he was elevated for this point in time. He had come into the kingdom. He had come to a position of power for such a time as this. 
He comes to power at a time when God is going to allow a severe famine of seven years to overwhelm the land. But God is gracious. He's faithful. He's always good. Prior to this famine, in God's mercy, he gave seven years of plenty. Joseph, the righteous and wise ruler, stewarded the seven years of plenty very conservatively in order to give them a chance at survival in the coming famine. As we come to Genesis 47, we're more than, we're more than two years into this famine. Joseph's righteous leadership provides a powerful example of what could be or how it should be in every area as it relates to government and people. In other words, this is an example of what God designed government to be and to do. Unfortunately, the curse of sin weaves its way into every area of life, including government, leading many of us this morning, even as God's people, who know what Romans 13 says and know how God has designed and ordained that things should be. We know what the Bible says, and yet many of us have developed a sense of bitterness toward law and toward those who are in position to enforce or enact laws. What makes all of this more significant is that the b- backdrop for this takes place amid crisis. You see, it seems as if we're living in a day and age in which during crisis, we become even that much more skeptical of our government and our leaders, don't we? And perhaps for good reason, because maybe we've seen illustrations or examples of a government leader seizing upon a crisis to advance himself, to make himself more powerful and to make himself more wealthy while while putting down maybe perhaps the rest of us to live lives that are substandard for what they were before the crisis. The world faced great challenge, which is again normally a time when people fracture and divide. But this kingdom, led by a righteous man, came together to reveal how it should be for people and their leaders. I find three specific, three specific ideas or concepts of how it should be in this text when you have a righteous man leading a group of people, number one, there should, be, there should be hope for the desperate. When there is a righteous man sitting in a position of power and authority, that should equate to there being hope for the desperate. Notice that the famine, it robbed people of their hope. As the people come to Joseph in verse number 13 all the way down through verse number 15, uh, there is a sense of hopelessness. You see, there is no bread in the land according to verse number 13. In verses 14 and 15, we discover that there is no more money. They have spent all of the money that they have made trying to buy bread in the first two years of this famine. And so with no bread and no money, hope quickly evaporated among the people. Did you discover that the people were so certain, they were so certain that they would soon die, they said to Joseph in verse number 15, give us bread for why should we die in thy presence? In other words, they, they, were, they were living off of the reserves. They were so desperate. They said, listen, it is very possible that before we finish this conversation with you in this room of this position of authority, that we will drop over dead here today. That's how desperate they were. That's how hopeless, that's how bad the situation had gotten. This famine had been promised by God to be very grievous, and it was measuring up to be exactly what God said that it would be. So we discover that the famine robbed people of hope. But, but I want you to notice that Joseph, the righteous leader, Joseph steps up and God uses Joseph to restore hope in verses 16 through 21. I read of a school system in a large city that had a program to help children keep up with their schoolwork during stays of sickness when they were perhaps in the city's hospitals. One day, a teacher who was assigned to the program received a routine call asking her to visit a particular child who was laid up in a hospital. She took the child's name and room number and talked briefly with the child's regular class teacher. We're studying nouns and adverbs in his class now, the regular teacher said, and I'd be grateful if you could help him understand them so he doesn't fall too far behind. The hospital program teacher went to see the boy that very afternoon. No one had mentioned to her that the boy had been badly burned and was in severe pain. Upset at the sight of the boy, she stammered as she told him, I've been sent by your school to help you with nouns and adverbs. When she left, she felt she hadn't accomplished a whole lot. 
But the next day, a nurse reached out to her and asked her, what did you do to that boy? The teacher felt she must have done or said something wrong, and she began to apologize. No, no, said the nurse. You don't know what I mean. We've been worried about that little boy, but ever since yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's fighting back. He's responding to treatment. It's as though he's decided to live. Two weeks later, the boy was able to communicate And he explained that he had completely given up hope until that teacher arrived. Everything changed when he came to a simpler realization. He expressed it this way. They wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? You see, hope, hope made all the difference in the life of that young man. And when Joseph uh, responds to the people and and their their request to give us bread, and Joseph comes up with a plan whereby they can have more bread, he restored hope to them. You know, lots of politicians promise hope, but very few deliver. The people were desperate, and they cried, give us bread, but the problem is they had no money. You know, there's nothing in life that is free. You figured that out by now, haven't you? Everything costs something. Sadly, we live in a society in which there are a lot of people that feel like, well, you know, you just just give it to me. But everything costs something. Joseph, the righteous man in authority, he displayed great ingenuity and wisdom. They didn't have any money to spend. All the paper money, all the currency, all the coins, all of the gold was gone, as it were. But they did have something of value. They had cattle. And so for a whole year, the people bought food with horses and with cows, with lambs and with donkeys. But this famine stretched on. The people came back to Joseph having spent all of their money and cattle, but they still had land and they still had property. They still had houses. They still had their bodies. They were so desperate for hope and a future that they agreed to part with their land and their personal autonomy in order to go on living. None of this would have been possible apart from Joseph and his wise leadership and execution of his stewardship plan found in Genesis 41, verses 47 through 49. In other words, during the years of plenty, when, uh, when the ground was bringing forth by heaps and by, uh, by, 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 by great amounts, they, they, they kept a portion of that and they set it aside. They said, we're going to need this someday, and now is the day in which they were going to need it. A wise leader acknowledges during days of plenty In days of difficulty, it won't always be this way. I mean, both sides. Sometimes we find ourselves in years or seasons in which, man, everything is going great. And we're tempted in our minds to forget about God. And we're tempted to think, you know, all of this is because of me. And it's always going to be this way. And I'm here to remind you, during days of plenty, it won't always be this way. By the same token... Perhaps some of you come into the room this morning and you're in a famine, as it were. Maybe not a physical famine where there's no food to eat. Maybe you're in a a season of famine. Maybe you're dealing with some struggles. Maybe there's some things happening in your home or some things happening in your life or maybe some things happening in the workplace and you're tempted to be so discouraged and you're tempted to think it's always going to be this way. I'm here to remind you that just as the good days don't always last, neither do the bad days. So keep hope. Joseph restored hope. Living within or even below your means during seasons of plenty is wise. Because of Joseph's leadership, the people were restored hope. It may have cost them all their money, all their cattle, all their land, and even their own physical bodies. But what is that if you're not alive anyways? This was the realization that these people came to. And so we see that in a In a government that is run by a righteous man, there is hope that is restored for those who are desperate. But notice, we see a second thing. We see in this this country that is ruled by a righteous man, not only is there hope for the desperate, we also discover there's respect for spiritual leaders. There's respect for spiritual leaders. Would you look in verse number 22? It says, only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh. And did eat their portion, which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their lands. If you'll skip down to verse number 26, you'll find sort of a repeat of that particular concept. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh. 
A minister pleasantly surprised his congregation one day by delivering a 10-minute sermon instead of his usual 30-minute message. Sounds, sounds nice to some of you right about now, doesn't it? As he concluded, he explained, I regret to inform you, brethren, that my dog, who appears to be inordinately fond of paper, this morning ate that portion of my sermon which I have not delivered. And then he said, let us pray. After the service, a stranger happened to be visiting that church from another church, approached the pastor and said, preacher, please let me know if that dog of yours has any pups. If it does, I want to buy one for my minister. (laughs) You know, it seems here in Egyptian society, in Egyptian culture, that there was great respect and reverence for for its spiritual leaders. Now, obviously, as we consider Egypt, we understand that it was a pagan culture and a pagan society. Most likely, these Egyptian priests that are being referenced here in verse 22 and verse number 26 were not priests of the one true Jehovah God. We understand that. However, I believe, I believe that the, the example set here is worth noting and it's worth considering. As I began to think on this particular thought, that in this, in this land we have a righteous man sitting in a position of authority and he's restoring hope to those that are desperate. And by the same, and by the same token, he is showing respect for the spiritual leaders of that land. What are spiritual leaders to do? Spiritual leaders exist, number one, to help people find and know God. That is their purpose that is, their, uh, that is their mission statement. And listen, if they accomplish this task, they're very valuable to the people that they minister among. There is an element in which they're, uh, they're, 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 uh, they're playing a critical role in our society, in our culture, and in our lives. It was Jonathan Edwards who said, I go out to preach with two propositions in mind. First, every person ought to give his life to Christ. Second, Whether or not anyone else gives him his life, I will give him mine. And every spiritual leader ought to have that as their mindset. Man, I'm going to preach, and I'm going to tell you as, as powerfully as I can, give your life to the Lord, and yet if all of you turn around and walk out the door and determine, I'm not going to do that, the preacher is is unmoved. He is going to do it anyways. He is going to give his life to Christ. The Bible says in Jeremiah 3 and verse number 15, God speaking to the nation of Israel, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Ephesians 4 verse 11 through 13, the Bible says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, a spiritual leader who's doing his job, who's called by God, who you allow to have some influence in your life, he is going to help you to become more and more the man, the woman, the husband, the wife, the family, the church that God would have us all to be. What is the purpose of spiritual leadership? Some might even ask, is spiritual leadership even necessary? And I remind you that from the very beginning, God ordained some form of spiritual leadership. I mean, we see it very early on. We see Adam being ordained as the leader of his home, as a husband. We see the idea of fathers. We see the idea of the leadership of priests and then of prophets and then of judges and kings and disciples and apostles and evangelists and eventually pastors and teachers. I mean, from the very beginning of time, God has always ordained that there be leaders leading his people. Some might be quick to dismiss the role of spiritual leadership, but it's quite obvious from the scriptures that God designed it and that God always provides his people with a man to lead them spiritually. And when there is no man, the Bible indicates even there in the book of Judges that there was a woman who stepped up and led the people of God. Spiritual leadership, the spiritual leaders, I should say, communicate God's message to man. Can I say that they don't just stand before a group of people and communicate a message. No, if they're going to be the true spiritual leaders that God would have them to be, not only do they communicate that message, but they are to live that message. They're to live what they preach. 
They're to lead people towards spiritual growth. Spiritual leaders aren't perfect, but they're growing, they're, they're striving, they're moving forward in their relationship with the Lord. And so spiritual leaders exist to help people find and know God. And that's why the nation of Egypt put a priority upon them. They wanted to know this God. Perhaps most of them were very uncertain about who God was and what role God played in their lives and what they owed God and how to get to know God. And I have to tell you, probably the vast majority of these priests were probably not helping them get to know the true Jehovah God. And yet the concept still remains that there's value that is attached to that. Notice, secondly, we see not only that spiritual leaders exist to help people find and know God, but spiritual leaders who fulfill their calling should be rewarded. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. The Bible says about the pastors and the spiritual leaders who lead well in 1 Peter 5, 4, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. You know, we have to take a step back and admire Egypt for what they were trying to accomplish here. They made a provision for those in spiritual leadership that rewarded the priests for their role in society. It seems as if the priests were in some form receiving some type of government benefit and they were taken care of by the Egyptian government. Now listen, I'm not at all recommending that spiritual leaders be rewarded by the state or government in this way. That can get us in trouble in a hurry. Remember, we're also talking about a pagan society prior to Joseph's involvement. What I'm applauding is a culture that recognizes the value of spiritual leadership and blesses those who are functioning in this role. Today's culture has lost most, if not all, respect for its spiritual leaders. And before I go any further, much, much of this loss of respect is earned. It's been earned by the serious misdeeds of those in spiritual leadership positions. However, however, I believe it is also symptomatic of a steep decline in our culture toward anything of a spiritual nature. In other words, in other words, many pastors have done many egregious things that have caused lots of people to say, if that's what spiritual leadership, I, I want no part of it. And yet in some conditions, in some places, spiritual leaders have, have done the right thing, have been a blessing, and have been a help to people. And yet, and yet those same people have said, you know, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in what this person has to offer and what this person is trying to accomplish simply because they have no spiritual heart. Can I say that regardless of what the world does, God's people should value, should prioritize, and should respect anyone who is laboring to help them find and know God better. You know, God's people should have a pastor. They should place themselves under their pastor for spiritual guidance and for spiritual accountability. If the man functions well in his office and calling, then he should be taken care of. He should be cared for just as the Egyptians cared for their priests. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Lest anyone thinks that this is being preached as a, as a form of sort of stepping on the toes of the Cleveland Baptist Church, let me just say before we move on that this church has figured out this concept very well. And you, you, you do more than enough to take care of us, those of us that labor here in the word and in doctrine and teaching and in preaching. We are, we are blessed beyond measure. God has been so good to us. And I want to say publicly how grateful we are for your kindnesses to us. So many of you have done sweet things and kind things for me and my family, notes that are written and just little gifts here and there. What a blessing. It stirs our hearts and encourages, encourages us along the way. Thirdly and finally, we find in this culture, we find in this society how it should be. Well, there should be, there should be hope for the desperate. There should be respect for spiritual leaders in a culture and a society. And thirdly and finally, there should be compassion from leadership. Compassion from leadership. In verses 23 through 26, we discover Joseph is continuing to communicate with the people. You see, by this point and by this time, they have given all for bread. 
And I just want to remind you that as we think about this final thought, we must acknowledge that power, number one, has a corrupting tendency. Power has a corrupting tendency. Now think about what's happening in this culture. The people have spent all their money. They have no money left for bread. The people now have given all of their cattle just to survive, just to fill their bellies with bread. The people have given all of their lands to Pharaoh and to the government. Now the people have sold themselves and have sold their bodies just so that we can continue to live. And as Joseph and Pharaoh are buying up all of these things, it would have been very, very easy to have lined their own pockets with the spoils. Who would or who could have denied them this? I've traveled some. I have visited some places. And oftentimes the word that enters into my mind as I visit some of these places, perhaps that are third world countries, is you see see evidences of the squalor in which people live. I mean, you see it everywhere. People living on top of each other. I've, I've seen homes made out of cardboard. I've seen homes made out of plywood with no actual doors and windows, exposure to the elements and to all of the difficult things that, that, that you and I would, would think of in a, in a place like that. And then, and then you drive just a little bit further and you see people living in palaces and people enjoying all of the wonderful, nice things that, that, that money could buy and that life could have. And then you're reminded those are the leaders. Those are the people in charge. Those are the people that are supposed to be looking out for those that are living in the cardboard huts, and yet they're doing nothing. They're living life in a a way that uh, that, that is good. And around our world, we find kings and dictators and presidents and sultans and sheiks who live in extravagance and opulence while their constituents suffer in squalor. Here's what happens. Those who seize hold on a position of power They often struggle to avoid using that power and that position for personal benefit or advancement. In other words, they they get in a position of power and they begin to realize, man, I can enrich myself with this. Who can deny me? I can take a little extra and I can do a little bit more. And and the problem is, is that's done at the expense of the people. Most of us have some sense of mistrust in our government leaders because of the rampant corruption that flows through the streets of Washington, D.C. and flows through the other seats of government power and government authority. And we know, we know it to be true. You can take a good man and you can elect him to a position of power and authority and it's not long before he's wrestling with using that power and that authority for his own personal benefit and not thinking about the people who put him in that position of power to begin with. Look what we discover. We discover a difference because there's a righteous man who's ruling. We discover how it should be. And we see that Joseph grew Pharaoh's power and influence while continuing to care for the people. Make no mistake about it. There's no doubt that Pharaoh got much more wealthy during this period of time. But they did, listen, they did not leave the people behind. The government now owned their land and owned them. Most governments would have taxed their citizens four parts and allowed them to keep the fifth part. But instead, instead, Joseph, the righteous and wise leader, he taxed only the fifth part and he allowed the people to live off the four parts. In other words, the 80-20. They got to, they got to keep 80% and they had to give 20% back. Perhaps Joseph understood the principle that allowing people to keep more of what they earn incentivizes them to work harder and to be more productive. You know, the tax rate, In Egypt, a country, listen, a country that owned all the property and the people, did you know that it was lower than the tax rate in America today? A nation that claims to be the freest that there ever was? In America, anyone making more than $41,000 is taxed at 22%. While those making the highest amounts, those that make more than $539,000, probably nobody in this room, But those making more than $539,000 in a year, did you know that they pay 37% of their income to federal taxes? That's just about enough to make you sick, isn't it? There is no doubt, there is no doubt that Pharaoh's wealth and power increased exponentially during this time. But, But I want you to consider the attitude displayed by the citizens of this country in verse number 25. It's quite obvious that they did not, they did not feel a sense of betrayal. 
or abuse or neglect, nor do they feel like they had been treated unfairly. Look what they say. They said, thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. Wouldn't it be something if our government would say, you know, instead of just trying to get more and more and more out of people, out of citizens, out of constituents, why don't we just determine that we want, we want to, obviously we have to take care of our needs, but let's just stop right there. Let's not, well, let's not go overboard here. It sort of seems like that's what Joseph was doing. Joseph says, listen, I'll, I'll tax you the fifth part. You'll, you'll pay 20%. 80% you can keep for, your, for, for yourself. And by the way, 80% they kept for themselves in land that was not even theirs any longer was land that was now owned. And by the way, they were, they were given seed, the Bible says, by Joseph. Joseph gave them the seed to plant. And all they had to do in return was give 20% back and live on the 80% that they earned. You know, truthfully, it isn't taxes that we hate so much as it is paying taxes to people who we don't trust and who are afraid will squander or, or do what is not reasonable for them to do. The Egyptians were grateful that their government had been there for them in their time of need, and they pledged their best efforts to repay them. The, the bottom line is, we discover here their statement in verse number 25, they had trust in their government leaders. You saved our lives. We just want to find grace in your sight. Can you imagine for just a moment how different our country would be if we could abide by some of these principles? If we were to look out, if our leaders were to look out for those desperate for hope, if we were to give respect and reverence to those who are making our society draw closer to God and causing them to think about the spiritual side of things, and if our leadership were to show real, genuine, authentic compassion to its people, this country would flourish as it once did. What if if we were to apply these principles to our home? And what if we were to go home as leaders in our homes, many of you dads and moms that are in this room today, and you were determined, I'm going to give my children hope. We're going to show respect for the pastor and for the church and the work of God that is happening. We're going to raise our children to honor and love the word of God and the meeting of the church of God. And we're going to have compassion on one another. What if we were to take this message to our places of employment? And what if we, those of us perhaps who have positions of leadership, some some position in which you are a boss over someone and you were to show them a sense of hope and you were to show them compassion and you were to pray for them and to love them and to encourage them, how it would change our lives and our world? See, people simply want to be treated with kindness and respect. And may God's people lead the way in transforming our world into a place that is more of what it should be than what it currently is. So how do, I, how do I get to this point? There's no doubt that Joseph was a unique man. The power of God was upon him, wasn't it? We've seen that as we've studied his life. Can I tell you that you and I can have that same power of God upon us as well? It begins, of course, with the new birth, with knowing Jesus Christ as one's own personal Savior. If you're here today and you're lost, you've never responded to the message of the gospel And I must inform you that you're in a very, very dangerous place. See, we're never guaranteed tomorrow. We don't have any guarantees that we're going to live a long time. You may be a young man. You may be a young woman in this room today, but there are no guarantees. If you were to draw your last breath today, do you know for sure where you would spend eternity? It's life's greatest question. It's the one thing that God has demanded you figure out here on this earth that will determine and affect your eternal destiny. In just a moment, we'll stand together. We'll have counselors that'll be here across the front. If you're here today and there's some level of uncertainty about your eternal destiny, can I encourage you to leave where you are, to step out from your seat and to make your way to the front. Take the hand of one of these personal workers and let them know, I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I don't know if I were to die today that I'd go to be with God in heaven, but I'm concerned about it. So you really, you really expect me to step out from my seat with all of these people here and to come down to the front? And I just want you to know that the vast majority of people in here have made a decision like this at one point or another, and we've gathered today, we've prayed for you in advance. We would, we would be thrilled. We would rejoice. We would celebrate your coming. 
It'd be the greatest thing that happened here today is if someone were to come and to respond to the message of the gospel. By the same token, there may be some folks that are born again. Your life is not what it should be or how it should be because you've gotten distracted. And you're not functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit. Can I encourage you? Can I encourage you, if you allow the Holy Spirit to overcome you and to overtake you, oh, he'll change your life, he'll transform your life so that you could, you could do for your world what Joseph did for his. You could lead people to have a restored hope. And you could be the one who shows compassion to those who are weak and vulnerable. You might even be in a position of authority. And that temptation is there to let that position corrupt you. And yet, God has spoken to your heart today. He said, I don't don't want to use my position for my own good. I want to use my position to be a help and a blessing in this world today.